Hey guys, I've had a lot of questions about our off-grid solar setup, so in this video I'm going to talk about the components of the system, why we picked them over some of the other options that were out there, and a few related questions that a lot of you had. If you have any more questions, go ahead and pop those down there in the comment section. I promise we will attempt to collect them, try and have a follow-up video, although you've probably seen not really good at the follow-up videos here. At any rate, let's dive into what most people think of as the heart of a solar system, which is the solar panels, although I personally would call the inverter bank and all of that really the heart. At the moment, we have 40 solar panels. They're divided into two separate banks with identical capacities each. These are rec solar panels. You can see that they're their half cut style solar panels. So rather than a single cell, which would be this section here, they're half cut. This gives the array generally better shading performance and we've certainly noticed that. Now, shading performance wise, there is a bit that goes into the way the panels are interconnected because these are two sets of panels in series. So 10 panels in series and then those 10 panels are then paralleled together to create the appropriate DC voltage output for the Schneider inverter and char charger controller setup that we have. You can see that these panels are REC 370 watt split cut solar panels and they combine together over here and at some point you see that we have a Y connector that's what connects the two paralleled banks together and then that continues along to a photovoltaic array isolator. This is a really important thing to have. You need to have isolators regularly so that way you can turn off the DC power. Some locations may require that you have automated ones where if you turn it off in this particular spot they all turn off etc. Then everything comes together goes through a wiring box and then it goes down through the conduit on up to the inverter bank. Now we did two of these banks so 20 panels here, 20 panels over there, and then we have another 10 panels that we have yet to install somewhere else. Those are gonna go on micro inverters on the AC side of things. So everything down here is DC all the way to the inverter shed. We may actually install some additional panels down here, but they're gonna be on the AC side. So it was really fortuitous that we have these outdoor breaker panels. These happen on the property every 200 feet. We had to have pull boxes for the DC side while we were trenching. We also ran AC, so we ran two gauge copper all the way through things, breakers there. So that way we can actually feed power to the system on the AC side as well. We're probably gonna end up putting another bank of solar panels right there on that side. Those would feed in on the AC side with micro inverters. Then everywhere else we also have Wi-Fi running around everywhere because a lot of things require Wi-Fi as well as uh, security cameras, things like that. You can see over there, that's the piping over there, the conduit where the wires go down the conduit and they come back out over here on this other side. Which solar panel ends up right for you will depend on a wide variety of factors. If you have a limited amount of space, then you want to go with the highest output panels available. Basically, space efficiency, I guess you could say. Now, for us, space wasn't as much of a concern, and that's why we ended up with the 370 watt panels. The extra 10 panels are actually 385 watt panels because the price per watt has changed a little bit since then. And really that's all we were targeting was what's the most wattage we could get for the money on half cut panels that we were interested in. Now let's take a look at the inverters. The inverters and the charge controllers, they're all housed in this little blue shed right here. And that little sign on it says uh, the shed of three gables. That's what our neighbor decided to call it because it has three gables on it. And then over here we have the battery bank. We'll talk about that in a bit, but I'm gonna go ahead and uh, power up the lid. We have some hydraulic lift struts there to help open and close the lid for watering of the batteries. But let's take a look inside the inverter shed here. We went with Schneider Connext inverters. Now, which inverter bank you go with, that's gonna depend again on a wide variety of factors. We went with these for two very important reasons. The first one is that they support high voltage DC charging up to 600 volts. And because the solar panels are quite far away, they're way down there on the property, it made the most sense to go for high voltage DC systems there. Now you could have gone for different charge controllers, different inverters, etc., all running off the 48 volt DC bus. But for us, it made more sense for everything to work and live together. The other big reason, our next door neighbor has a version of these Schneider Connect XW inverters already. He only has one, we ended up with four of them, but I wanted a little bit of shared knowledge so that way we could assist one another if we had a particular problem. I decided to go with three inverters for two big reasons. We monitored how much power we were really consuming on a regular basis, and that kind of decided that we needed two of them. These are 6.8 kW continuous per inverter. And then there is a rating scheme where they can deliver up to 12 kW for one minute. They can deliver, it's like around 8 kW each for about 30 minutes. So it's sort of a sliding scale, depending on how much power you're pulling out of the inverter. All three of these together could peak at theoretically around 36 kW, or they could sustain 
14, 15 kW, absolutely no problem. Now, if you want three phase power off grid, you can do that with these three inverters. These can do split phase, 120 or 240, or if you have three of them together, you can do three phase power, which is kind of cool. We decided not to do that because we don't have any three phase things. But as we progress towards more things running off of renewable energy, basically electricity, and we start replacing some propane things with electric devices, we decided we needed the extra capacity. So here's how it sorts out. This is one inverter right here, and then below it we have a wiring junction box that's full of wires. Next to this we have the Schneider AC-DC breaker panel. So AC breakers up top labeled there. Some are just blanked out because we decided to uh, make sure that nobody played with them. And then down here we have the DC breakers for the three Schneider inverters. Then over here we have the two solar charge controllers. MPPT is the style of charger, maximum power point tracking. 100 refers to the DC amps that's capable of putting out 100 amps DC. 600 is the maximum DC voltage in their label. You can see this is the south array. That's the one that's pointing roughly west. Then down here we have some DC fuse blocks. These are used just for the charge controller. So you can see two charge controller inputs room for a third over there then we have another one over here because we have another Schneider inverter box the Schneider inverter box will also act as a DC charger so if you're operating these on an on-grid or grid tied system the Schneider system is capable of doing that that's one of the things that we liked about this setup is that we had the flexibility of being grid tied or grid independent it's up to you and when we started, we thought we might be grid tied more and now we're just completely off the grid. So that gave us the flexibility here. But if you need to run a generator on your system, here's something to consider. Even if you're running a really nice generator, which we occasionally do in the winter, this is a 7,000 watt diesel generator with a adorable Kubota diesel engine under there. Even a generator like this is gonna put out power that's not as clean as the inverters over there in the inverter shed. The way the system is theoretically supposed to work, according to Schneider, is that you connect the generator to one of the inputs. We have AC1 and AC2 on each of these inverter units. Uh, you would connect the generator to actually all three AC inputs. And then when the generator is running, it would then be passing through power, possibly charging the battery based on whatever is left. And then these guys would be managing how much power is being pulled from the generator, how much power is coming from or going to the battery bank, via the onboard chargers. However, it doesn't work as well as I would have liked in reality. So what we did was we just decided to use this guy right here as a 60 amp, 48 volt DC charger. So it's just connected to the generator. When the generator powers on, this is only going to be charging the 48 volt battery bank. Then these inverters pull power off that 48 volt bus. And however that sorts out, it just sorts out. This ended up being a lot less expensive than other 48 volt DC chargers that I was looking at. So that's how we ended up with another one. And it gives us an extra layer of redundancy. Up at the top of the shed, we have the disconnects for the high voltage DC lines. You can see they come in out of the ground, go up there and then down into the charge controllers over there. These allow us to disconnect the DC side up here or down below. And you have to make sure that you are getting appropriately rated DC interrupters like this. You can't just use a regular AC one. These are rated for 600 volts DC and the current that we're passing through. It's actually quite low current on the DC side. When everything is rip roaring along, it's maybe about 14, 15 amps, but it is over 300 volts DC. So you want to make sure it's not arcing. And then over here we have the connects gateway, which allows us to monitor everything via the internet. And of course, to make things easier, once the power has been inverted to AC, I have a breaker panel on this side for all the sub panels that the system powers. Now that the lid has been removed, you can see the batteries here. These are Charette Rolls 425KP something or other batteries. I'll put it on the screen if I can actually find, oh, here we go, 4KS 25P batteries. These are four volt lead acid, flooded lead acid batteries. So not sealed, not gel, not lithium ion, etc. The usable capacity of this array at our discharge rate is around 95 kilowatt hours. So Actual capacity is double that, but you only want to cycle these to a 50% cycle because they are lead acid. The most common question I get is why lead acid batteries? Why not lithium ion? Why not lithium ion phosphate? Well, there are a few reasons. The first one obviously is cost. Lead acid batteries like these are a lot less expensive. I even recently priced this out to see how prices are going and lithium ion and lithium ion phosphate home storage batteries, the cost seems to actually be going up more rapidly than lead acid batteries like these. So 
cost is a significant component. If I wanted this much storage in a lithium ion battery pack, it would have been at least double the cost of these batteries. They were already a little on the pricey side. Also cycle life. At our rated cycle, these batteries are warranted or described in the warranty literature, I guess I should say, because the warranty would actually take us beyond that, or the usage would take us beyond the warranty, I should say. These are rated for about 5,000 cycles to the depth of discharge that theoretically we're gonna maximize them out on. And at the depth of discharge we average, which is around 30% or so depth of discharge, these should last around 8,000 cycles. So considerably longer than a lithium ion battery pack where we would be cycling it down to about 80% or so. Now there are a few downsides. The first downside is maintenance. You do have to water a flooded lead acid battery, which is why we have these little level indicators here. These are kind of cool. We didn't get an automated watering system, but you can see minimum and maximum water level in there. And then you have to feed them distilled or deionized water. Now, fortunately, we have our own water deionizer, so that's not a problem for us. Uh, but that is a consideration if you're trying to do this on your own. You are going to need to fill the batteries and maintain their level. You need to monitor them at least once a month, especially in the summer when the temperatures are warmer and they're gonna be off gassing a bit more. Now, speaking of the summer, that's the other reason that we chose lead acid batteries. We are in a temperate climate, but it can get down to about 35 degrees out here and it can get up to maybe about 95 degrees to 100 degrees on a very rare occasion. These lead acid batteries, they can live out here in this enclosure absolutely just fine. It's within the temperature profile for these batteries. Lithium ion, however, they would need to be in a conditioned space. So we would need to either have a separate building that was air conditioned or air conditioned this inverter building, something along those lines. That is a significant consideration. But again, more of a this situation thing. So if you live in town, especially if you live in a moderate climate, you could have your lithium ion batteries in your garage, probably wouldn't be a problem. And if you lived in a hotter climate, you could have your lithium ion batteries in some sort of closet or something that's part of the air conditioned space or they could separately condition. For us, charge cycle efficiency really negates any benefit from that. So even though these batteries charge cycle efficiency is going to be somewhere between 85 and 90 percent, and that's about 10 percent lower than a lithium battery pack, the extra cost and the extra energy consumption of conditioning the space the batteries would live in would probably consume any benefit that that had. And this is probably where I should talk about efficiency because the entire system efficiency is not simply related to those batteries. A lot of power ends up going down the drain when you really look into it. The first thing you'll notice is if I go in here, obviously there's panel efficiency, but the big loss here really is the charge controller efficiency. If I look at the solar charge controller that's servicing, you can see the west bank of panels right there. 5,165 watts is going in, 4,790 watts is coming out. That's a reasonable amount of loss, and most of that is being given up as heat. Because inside these solar charge controllers, which do have a lot of hot air coming out the top, we basically have inverters and rectifiers. So the electricity comes in as DC. In order to change the voltage to whatever voltage the system needs, it is then inverted to AC and then rectified back to DC on the inside of these things. There are other ways to convert the voltages on the DC side of things, but that's the easiest ones. That's what most people end up doing and what most units end up doing on the inside. When both charge controllers are operating at their maximum output, the loss is somewhere around 800 watts total. So at least two full solar panels are just being burnt on the fire of inefficiency. Then the power goes into the battery pack. It actually goes underground and then into the battery bank there. We lose about 10% to 15% depending on the charge discharge rates of the battery pack. Important to keep in mind, your actual loss on a lead acid battery pack is gonna depend on the temperature and how rapidly you're charging or discharging. Then over here on the inverter bank, each of these inverters is also sacrificing something on the altar of inefficiency. So the least efficient way to do this is actually to have these three inverters. If I only ever had two, that would actually be more efficient, but these are not the best at sleeping and then waking up. There is a mode where Schneider says you can have one inverter go to sleep and then cascade along. So only one will do its thing, then the next one will kick in, then the next one will kick in. That doesn't end up working so well. So we've decided to just go ahead and sacrifice the, you know, maybe extra 2% or so that we lose by having all three running all the time. But here we're losing between five and 10%, depending on exactly the kind of output that's going on. It's worth noting that those inverters, like most inverters, are more efficient towards the top of their output range. So the lower the output, the lower the efficiency. Hopefully that's answered a lot of your questions about the solar off-grid setup. 
we could have gone with a smaller battery pack if we had adjusted our usage. And that's probably another important thing to know is that when we're talking about off-grid stuff like this, you can either adapt the power system to your consumption or you can adapt your consumption to your power reality. And that's really the difference between what we decided to do and what our next door neighbors decided to do. They adapted their lifestyle to their power reality. We decided to do the opposite because we also wanted to do things like recycle all of our water. So we recycle all of our gray water and our black water, and then we reuse it in the garden. The downside to this obviously is power consumption. We consume about 24 kilowatt hours a day simply on treating water, but we're doing that by the power of the sun. Now, clearly, if you wanted to drive an electric car, instead of doing that, you could consume those 24 kilowatt hours over there. But that's part of why we ended up with the battery pack that size. We were really torn about battery sizing, so it's really important if you're planning on doing this, get an excellent idea of your power consumption. I would suggest spend an entire year with a power monitor, like one of those Philips power monitors or Sense power monitors, whatever, stick it on your main, see all of the electricity that you're consuming for absolutely every use, get a really good picture of what you're doing every Every month of the year and then maybe add 50% because keep in mind in the winter you're gonna be producing less power they're gonna be more clouds they're gonna be rainstorms etc and be prepared to either need to reconnect to the grid or use a generator I think it's gonna be really hard to live without either of those two options I do know some people that live off-grid without a generator and let's just say that in the colder and darker times of the year they spend a decent amount of time with no power at all Hopefully this video has helped you if you're considering doing something similar. If you have any burning questions, pop them down there in the comment section below. I don't know if we'll be able to get to them all, but we will use them to help inform a future episode to try and answer some of those questions. See all of you later.